adding RIP Next Generation to IPv6. Let's begin. I'd like to imagine that you and I are putting together a test network. So we come up with an IP addressing scheme of this, we put our cables and connectors together, and we configure each of the interfaces with the appropriate IP address. My question is, once this is all in place, how do we test that to make sure it's actually working? Well, one of the answers to that is we could do a simple ping. We could go to R1 and try to ping R3's address just to verify that R3 is responding and able to communicate with us. Let's do that right now. So on R1, let's do a quick ping. Now we could type in all the characters for the IPv6 for the subnet, for the host ID, or we could just do a show IPv6 interface brief and take a look at what the address is and you just borrow some of the address already. So this is the serial one slash one interface. Let's go ahead and do a ping and we'll ping out to 2001 db 8678313 13 colon colon and his address is colon three right here. So we'll paste that part in, put in the three and verify it. So we're like, woohoo, the ping works. IPv6 is good between here and here. And the next question is, can we ping something that's not directly connected? For example, can we ping the 23 network? And the answer is, if we tried that, let's go ahead and try it real quick. It's not going to succeed. And while this prepares to fail, let's go ahead and go to 23.3, which is the same exact router. However, it's this interface. If we try doing that ping, it fails. And it says it's not flying. I don't have the ability to ping that address. Why is that? It's because routers, based on directly connected interfaces alone, don't know about remote networks. We don't know about the 23 network, says R1. I can't ping it from here. To help it along its way, we can use a dynamic routing protocol like RIP Next Generation, and to configure it is a piece of cake. It is different in the configuration than IP version 4's RIP. Instead, we're going to go to interface configuration mode, and we're going to simply going to say, I want you, Mr. Gig20 and Serial11 and Serial10, I want you to participate in the interface configuration. I want you to participate in this RIP routing process, and you just name it. You can call it Bubba or Tom or Our RIP. You simply name a routing process. It dynamically spawns it off and creates it. So without further ado, let's put those three interfaces into RIP. To do this, you don't want to blink or you might miss it. We're simply going to go into configuration mode and then in each interface configuration, tell it that we want it to be part of a routing process. Now I'm going to use the word our RIP to represent the routing process. And I told every interface that it's enabled for that group, if you will. And that's it. So now I have these three interfaces, the physical interfaces, and also let's do the loopback interface as well. And that'll put all four interfaces on R1 into and participating with RIP. Now we want to go to R2 and R3 and do the same exact thing. So over on R2, a little road trip over there. Configuration mode, interface gig2 slash zero, serial one zero, serial one one, and also loopback zero. It just so happens I'm using the same exact interface numbers on each of these devices to make it nice and easy. So in the background, as each interface starts up RIP, it's going to start advertising and receiving advertisements from any neighbors who are out there, RIP messages. And let's make a final road trip over to R3 and add this in. Now, once this is in place and R1 and R2 and R3 are all participating in RIP, we should have the ability then to see RIP learned routes on each of the neighbors. So R1, who couldn't ping the 23 network a little bit ago, should now be able to ping the 23 network, assuming that R3 and or R2 have advertised that network through the RIP routing protocol. We should also have access to all of our loopbacks because those are also being advertised inside of the RIP routing process. Let's make a road trip back to R1 and let's find out. So I should have that in my history. There we go. There's our ping we did initially to 23 colon colon three. And we'll go ahead and press enter and see if that flies. And it does. And if we do a look at our routing table, we'll do a show IPv6 route. I'm going to just say, please just show me the routes you learned via RIP. Let's take a close look at these routes in the routing table. We have the two sub network right here, which is this guy. And he says, I'm going to use serial one slash zero. And my next top is going to be R2's link local address. I've got the three subnet, which is right here. I'm going to go this direction out serial one, one. And the next top is R3's link local address. And then check this out. We have the 23 network, this guy right here, and it has two equal cost paths. So it put them both in the routing table, but they both have the same metric of two, two hops away. And then we have the link local address of R2 and R3 respectively. One interesting note is that when a router puts a route in its routing table, R2 advertised this 23 network and so did R3 with a hop of one. But with IPv6, when we receive a metric of one with RIP, 
we actually add another hop to it for the ingress interface and then they put that inside of our routing table. So even though it was advertised with a hop count of one because it's directly connected to R2, that's why they show up with a hop count of two in R1 routing table, which is a little bit different than what happens with RIP for IP version four. And then we have the loopback interfaces as well. Here's the loopback of R2 and here's the loopback of R3, all showing up in the routing table courtesy of RIP. In this micro nugget, we've taken a look at how we can very quickly use a basic routing protocol like RIP Next Generation to provide full connectivity in a sample network. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.